Why, hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, I'm rocking the fryer hoodie because it's a fun and important one. Today, talking about some under-the-radar Padres heading into this season to keep an eye on three batters, three pitchers, my picks. We're going to get into them. You know what you're listening to. Let's get started. You are Locked On Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Tuesday, Tuesday, February 21st. As always, I'm your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres if you get tired of my comic book tweets. That is all Padres stuff all the time, and I love interacting with you guys. And also, Lockdown Padres on YouTube, where you can see me rocking my friar robe. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I'm a swinging friar on today's episode. I bring this out for important episodes, so believe me, this is going to be fun. Um, and also, if you want to check out the Tatis bobblehead in that YouTube video, there's a description. A link in the description, I should say. For today's episode, guys, mm, 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 mm. I, cooked, I cooked you up a good one. At least I hope a good one. A fun, classic topic. You know what I mean? I'm not breaking any uh minds here with the topic of today's episode which is underrated padres or i should say under the radar padres to kind of keep your eye on heading into this 2023 season some at least some there are so many others certainly out there and i'm probably going to be wrong on all six of the ones that i'm going to be talking about today three hitters and th um three pitchers uh my picks that i'm going to be keeping on an eye on in spring training throughout the season that probably aren't going to be talked about a lot i don't i'm not here to say that nobody is talking about these players i think most of these players that i have uh people are talking about them but in terms of you know regular casual fans people who don't follow the padres as much um i think these are some guys that could potentially be real contributors for this team this year and don't get me wrong just because a player that i am going to talk about on today's episode this does not mean that i think that they're going to be a cy young winner this does not mean i think they're going to be an all-star uh, type of player that doesn't even mean I think they're going to have above a two war you know what I mean I don't even not even necessarily two wins but I do think that they could potentially become really important players add to the depth because this is not a Padres team that necessarily needs breakouts because you have all those superstars everyone's going to be talking about the Justice League top of the lineup this year and they're going to be talking about the three-headed hyena hydra hyena hydra that's a little conflicting, but the three headed uh, Hydra of the starting rotation as well. So I thought this would be a lot of fun. So let's without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start off with hitters and let's start off with one that every Padres fan is familiar with. Oh, man. Mm -mm -mm. And it's a little bit of a two and one this first pick. All right. So technically, I, I guess maybe I lied about there being three batters or three hitters, but nonetheless, it still counts. First one I want to talk about is Trent Grisham. And everybody is familiar with this lad. Or some would say this bloke, because this dude for the last year and a half has been everything that we didn't think was going to happen. This is a dude who came into the league and was known for having a good eye at the plate. And then he has the big mess up with the Brewers right in the playoffs. He has that massive fielding error and it's really rough. I feel bad for the guy. And then he comes to the Padres and redeems himself, wins a gold glove and was one of the maybe 15 best outfielders in baseball. For at least a decent stretch of time, he started off 2021 a little bit hurt, but even in 2020 and the much that he did play for the first half of 2021, he was excellent. This is a guy who hit for a decent amount of power, who could get on base, who could steal some bags and play some gold glove level defense in center field. And everything fell apart. I was early on the belief last year that Trent Grisham wasn't very good. I just thought that there's too many times that I'm watching a Padres game, albeit sometimes I'm doing something else on the side, but nonetheless, it's some weak grounder to first base. It seems like almost every single at bat, the pitchers are targeting the same areas that they throw outside. They throw these, these type of pitches that he wants to sit on because they're not perfect or whatever, right? And then they pitch him inside and he just, with his weird, I, I just that weird, but like unorthodox swing, seems to not be able to catch up to those balls. But, the reason I want to talk about Trent Grisham is because if you frequent Padres Twitter, a stat by Eno Saris, who's a great writer over at um, 
over at The Athletic, um, put out a stat about the biggest jumps and hard hit rate in the second half this past season. And the names are interesting. They are very interesting. And this got Padres Twitter, of course, riled up because, in fairness, everything gets Padres Twitter riled up. But I thought it was very interesting that uh, people were bringing up this tweet a lot, and I figured I might as well talk about this on the show. And that is, like I said, the highest – ooh, the Hawks fired Nate McMillan. Wow. Um, that Yeah, Trey Young. Guys, secretly, he's not that good. Just throwing it out there. Trey Young's not that good. He's fun, though. I'll give him that. But anyway, the top second-half surgers in hard hit rate in the second half, which, rem- reminder, is a ball hit 95 miles per hour or plus – Trent Grisham is number number one with a plus 22% difference, which is wild. And then there's a bunch of other guys on there. Here's the thing. There's two things. Number one, the rest of the guys on this list don't necessarily inspire a lot of confidence. Number two is Brandon Crawford, who outside of a extremely random, very weird 2021, has really never been all that plus of a bat. All right, whatever. If he's had a 106 WRC plus, my apologies, guys. But you know what I mean. That's never been what he's been known for. He's been known for consistency and being able to go out there and play good defense, not for his bat. After that, Victor Robles, a player that I admittedly thought was going to be a stud, and he was not. After that is Kyle Tucker, then Tyler O'Neill, then Enrique or Kike Hernandez, Hassan Kim, who's on there at number seven. Oh, yes, sir. Nate Lowe at number eight, Eugenio Suarez at number nine and then JT real Muto with plus 9% at 10. So there's some interesting players there. Certainly Uh, I would be thrilled if Trent Grisham was showing any similarities to Cal Tucker, because that would make the Padres just one of the best Padres teams of all time. If he could do that, but the Brandon Crawford's your uh, Nate Lowe, you know what I'm saying? Nathaniel Lowe. I, I just not necessarily the best names to be associated with. My thing with Grisham is that I've never had any questions about his power, like literally ever. He still hit a decent amount of home runs last year. He could still clock the ball pretty far when he is manages to make contact, but that's the issue. I just don't know if he can make contact. There's plenty of guys who can hit the ball hard that aren't able to put the ball, the bat on the ball enough that it just won't account for much. That being said, I do think that there isn't much that Trent Grisham could possibly be worse at when it comes to his bat this year. This is a guy who hit below 200. I mean, Victor Robles did better than that. Tyler O'Neill, when he was awful at the beginning of the season, did better than that, right? And Tyler O'Neill, I actually think, is going to have a pretty decent season. But my thing is, if Trent Grisham just becomes a 230 batting average guy, 240 batting average guy, as long as he can just get a little more, because the walks are there, he can still get a really good walk rate. But if he can just cut down on the strikeouts a little bit, if he can fine-tune his approach, I'm going to be a little bit curious to see if maybe his stance changes, if his path toward the ball changes a little bit because I think that's a little bit of a problem. I think his swing is a little bit almost too predictable. It seems like pitchers just know what to throw him. And I think that's evidenced by next to Cody Bellinger, one of the worst expected Wobas, one of the worst Wobas, one of the best overall offensive ratings among all players since the second half of 2021. That's, that's kind of where I'm at, right? Cody Bellinger is where we are with Trent Grisham. Do I think he can be better than Cody Bellinger? Absolutely. So that's why I think he's a little bit under the radar and he's one to keep an eye on just because I don't think there's too much that he has to do to get better. And if he can still play good defense, that's fine. You don't have to be a superstar, but I'd like him to do that. Maybe steal a couple more bags, be a little bit more aggressive on the base paths. Everything that could go wrong last year went wrong, I guess, under the radar only because there's nowhere to go but up. But I am still skeptical, and just because his hard hit rate spiked in the second half, that doesn't have me completely changing my mind because I never had any doubt that Trent Grisham had power. I think we all kind of knew that. You know what I mean? The problem is that he became a little bit of a Joey Gallo last season where he was walking a decent amount, but he was also striking out a lot, and he just couldn't hit worth a damn. So that's the issue. But, ladies and gentlemen, I spent a long time talking about my first batter, so we're going to have to type, uh, try and speed things up just a tad bit. I mean, I am wearing the friar robe that should, you know, come with it. Some magical powers and some more organization on my part, but sometimes it doesn't. But you know what always comes through? You know what's always organized? You know what always has magical powers, my friends? Built Bar. Oh, 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 yes. Look, I've mentioned on the show before. I've been working out, trying to, you know, fine tune myself, lose a little bit of the pounds, try not to be such a, a slob, which is what I am known for. 
You know what I mean? Try and be like Manny. You know what I mean? Try and be like Tatis. Be all, maybe not necessarily Tatis, uh, but try and be like these guys. And Bill Bars help out with that, right? They help satiate your sweet tooth. They are super, super yummy. And they have all these flavors covered in 100% chocolate. And I mean real chocolate, not some f- uh, fabricated thing. 100% real chocolate. And like I said, all the flavors. I mean, churro? Come on. Come on. Mm-mm. Churros are fantastic. You want to try those. They're, they're they're just, they're great all the time. There's actually a churro place by me that makes, I'm getting off topic. Anyway, there's peanut butter brownie. There's coconut almond. I'm not really sure how they do it because also, I mean, if you check out the macros, only 130 calories, four grams of sugar and a whopping 17 grams of protein. So when you have that sweet tooth, these things come through, man. They really do. And they've been coming through for me lately too. Personally, my favorite is Cherry Barcia. And again, Bilt Bar, if you folks are listening, Please bring back the Apple Almond Crisp. Hashtag bring back Apple Almond Crisp. That was my favorite in the world. Uh, But guys, go check them out. Not just at Built.com, but also at your Walmart. You know, you can check out the the pharmacy section. You can grab yourself a box. They have... um, they have puffs as well, like the kind of smaller versions and whatnot. They taste really good as well. They've got four bar boxes, 13 bar boxes. So go check them out, ladies and gentlemen, built.com or, you know, your Walmart or Sam's Club. Trust me, the best protein bar you will ever eat. Let's keep moving, ladies and gentlemen. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about my second pick, which has a little bit to do with the first pick, and that is Jose Azokar. Outfielder for the San Diego Padres, probably going to make the team, very likely to make the team. And I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, Javier Reyes, why are you so obsessed with Jose Azokar? Well, it's for admittedly some pedestrian analysis on my part, which is that I just think that sometimes the Padres, they just need someone who can go out there and put the bat on the ball. He does not have the upside, I will say, Jose Azokar, at least I don't think, of Trent Grisham. He does not have nearly the amount of power. In fact, he basically has no power. Um, But when it comes to his defense, I don't think he's gotten enough of a play in center field or anywhere. In fact, I think that he hasn't shown definitively that he can't be necessarily just as good as Trent Grisham in the outfield. His sprint speed is in the 96th percentile. His outs above average is in the 94th percentile. His jump is in the 96th percentile. And his arm strength is in the 84th percentile. Again, he does not have power. He does not have the best on-base skills either. He had a 298 OBP last year. But again, 200 at-bats, he's still young. I mean, this was his first year, and I just think that give this guy some more play. I want to see. Do we know for sure that he can't give us what Trent Grisham gave us last year? Can this be a guy who maybe he hits 250 with a 320 on-base? What if he's like Hassan Kim at the plate? You know what I mean? You see, what if he's just a Hassan Kim type of player at the plate? The Padres already have plenty of power, especially when the goober, Fernando Tatis Jr. gets back. You've got Soto, who's probably going to have an MVP season. You've got Manny. You have Xander Bogarts. There's power on this team. And not to mention they brought in Matt Carpenter, who I'm a little bit skeptical of. I know that, you know, not necessarily as much as other people. I think other people are a lot more bullish on him and think he's going to be great. Um, But even still, They've got great bats, so he doesn't. Need, we don't necessarily need a ton of power in this lineup. There's potential upside there, especially when Tatis comes back. But I, that's that's my overall thing. I think that we have not seen enough play from Jose Azokar. I know that it's a, a relatively small sample size, but again, if he becomes Hassan Kim at the plate, if he can be a 100 or even a, a 106 WRC plus guy, I would not mind that. And even if he necessarily doesn't get as much playing time as Trent Grisham. It's really good to know that you have that backup because the Padres for years now have had a big issue with outfielder depth, right? They are, they had, they brought in Jake Mrznik a few years ago. That was a disaster. Obviously you've had the issue with Grisham. I remember trading uh, Manuel Margo. That probably hurt the team a decent amount, especially because Emilio Pagan didn't turn out all that great. So just the depth point of view, that way, if anything happens to any of the Padres outfielders, Or if Tatis takes a little bit longer getting back to his regular self, what if anything? Lord knows he's not, you know, uh, necessarily an Iron Man. He ain't Coward of Kajudir when it comes to staying healthy. It's good to know that you have someone on the bench who can give you a really, really good defense. So that's who I'm keeping an eye on there. The last batter that I want to talk about is another one that a lot of people know about, but I feel like you got to talk about it. You do. You just have to. (sighs) Man. It's, It's funny because... If you think about it, there aren't too many under-the-radar bats on this Padres team. I, I really don't think so. I think that 
most of the guys that are under the radar are only under the radar because of the other guys, right? Because entering this season, the difference between last year's opening day is a Soto, right? Is a Xander Bogarts, is a Matt Carpenter, is a Nelson Cruz potentially, right? Like, so I think that as a result, a guy like Jake Cronenworth or who I want to talk about now, a guy like Luis Campizano, they fly a little bit under the radar. The Padres don't need much, right? They do not need much from um, a lot of players. They just need them to be average because they have the stars in place. That's how you build you know, a baseball team for the most part. The issue with this is I have never seen a prospect that has been so all over the place in terms of just this is a guy who was one of the golden eggs once upon a time, which is what I called them, right? It was Mackenzie Gore. It was CJ Abrams. It was Robert Hassel. And then it was Luis Campizano. Obviously that changed a little bit. James Wood ended up being a little bit of the golden egg instead, but those were like the four super duper pot prospects that the Padres had left. And for years, I've had Arm Layton on the show. He's co-founder of Just Baseball. He's a big prospects guy. He's been telling me about this dude for literally years. He actually texted me the other day. He's writing his Padres farm system right up, which we're going to talk about next week, by the way. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, or maybe not next week, but, you know, eventually we're going to talk about it. Um, he's he's texting me like, look, man, I'm tired of writing about Luis Campizano. I don't understand. This guy rakes. If you look at his minor league stats, Luis Campizano has been productive. And don't get me wrong, I know that they were minor league stats, and I know a lot of people like to bring up, well, when he was in the majors, he looked bad. I'm like, well, yeah, that's because you made him start his career as a pinch hitter against Kenley Jansen in, like, bottom of the ninth games. He didn't get enough of a run. He never gets enough of a run. And the reason why that's been frustrating to me is because I don't understand why Austin Nola is the one. I can understand if, say... There's some other catcher out there, right? Maybe maybe you got a legend like Yadier Molina, right? Just be, even if he's not that good anymore last year, he's a legend. I get it. Maybe you've got a, you know, a, a decent catcher. I can't think of a deal. An Omar Narvaez, whatever. Like, okay catchers. Uh, Christian Va uh, Velasquez, right? In instead, it's Austin Nola who got gave us a negative war last year. Not like negative three or anything like that. But he resulted in a negative war. He's not the best pitch framer. He's not necessarily going to throw out a ton of runners. And I understand that there are criticisms with Luis Campizano and his defense. I get that. I get that some people are wondering, why does he put the glove down? Right? I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. From what I've been told, that's just how catchers are kind of taught. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. But for me, man, it's just, why doesn't this guy get a chance? This doesn't make any sense. Just last year... In let's just see real quickly if I could pull up his numbers, that would be awesome. Um, in AAA, he slashed 298, 363, 43. Year before that, yes, he started off a little bit um slow, but then he ended with 295, 365, 541. I don't understand how the Padres know for sure, for certain, all these years that he would be worse than Austin Nola. That's my issue. That's my issue. I'm not saying he will be amazing. This is more of a, he's got to at least be a better bat than Austin Nola. And for right now, he is expected to be the starter. And my thing with Aus uh, Luis Campizano as well is on top of the way, I don't think that they've handled him correctly um, and kind of just bringing him up like that, I think was a mistake. It's not everybody can be Tatis and just immediately come into the league and light things up. The other thing with Luis Campizano is, oh, well, he doesn't, the pitchers don't like pitching for him. I already mentioned that he keeps the glove down before the ball is there, whatever even though apparently from what I've heard, that's how they're teaching catchers and that's fine. What I don't like about that is not too long ago, there was a catcher by the name of Yasmani Grandal, who also reportedly pitchers didn't like pitching for. I do not want to do this whole what pitchers prefer thing, especially when it is resulting in a negative, especially when there's the same Padres team last year that was seemingly very open about supporting the ground ball gremlin, Eric Hosmer, right? They don't have a great track record of being out there for some of their guys and that ending up them being right. You know what I'm saying? That being like, oh, actually, yeah, the players were right. We should have given this guy a longer leash. So I don't want to do that because Yasmani Grandal was, is an excellent catcher. Unfortunately, it looks like he's on the, the declining part of his career, but he's an excellent catcher. Excellent walk rate, excellent power. I just think that this is one of the biggest X factors on the entire team, to be quite honest with you. If you look at overall 
you know, kind of production in terms of offense from major league catchers, the WRC plus is around like 89, right? Can Luis Campuzano, Campuzano give you better than an 89 WRC plus? I will take that bet right now. I'll, I'll wager my Tatis bobblehead. Absolutely, he can do better than an 89 WRC plus. But the defense is going to be the question. But my issue is it's not like Austin Nola is Buster Posey at his prime defensively. Heck, it's not like he's Austin Hedges. That is my big issue. So for all those reasons, Luis Campizano, while not necessarily as under the radar, I think because of this lineup, because of everybody that's been added, if this dude comes out and has at least a decent offensive season, people are going to be thrilled. And that will give them an advantage over a lot of other teams in baseball. Um you know, especially teams like the the Giants, especially teams like hopefully the Diamondbacks, the Rockies, some other teams in the National League, like the Cardinals, right? Like the Brewers, certainly. I don't think it's going to take too much. So I'm really excited for Luis Campuzano this year. I suggest drafting him in your fantasy leagues because he's not going to cost anything. And I just don't think he's had a free reign of it. They've never been like, boom, play for a month. Let's see what happens. And I think that's been really unfair to him. So I'm really excited for him in 2023. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, he ain't the only one that I'm excited for. We have to talk about pitchers because I spent way too much time talking about hitters. Oh, my gosh. So this episode is probably going to be a little bit longer. Uh, But before we get into that, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've reached the midway point of these under the radar targets. But we have also reached the midway point of the NBA season. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet. Up to $1,000. $1,000. I don't know why I'm speaking like this. $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. You know me. When it comes to the NBA, I think uh, this second half for Tatum, man. I don't know. Remember last year the Celtics blew up in the second half too? I don't know. I think it's a little bit weird. We're going to see how that all goes down. But trust me, guys, go check out FanDuel. They've got all sorts of great bets. I'm not necessarily the biggest betting man in the world, but I promise you, they have you set up in every which way possible. They've got tip-offs. They've got everything. They've got all of the over-unders for players. They've got steal over. they got everything there. So go check that out. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Official sportsbook betting partner of the NBA. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to pitchers. Some under the radar pitchers heading into the season. And I think that these are actually genuinely some more under the radar players. I know. And again, my apologies if this wasn't hipster enough these picks for you that I've been doing so far. Right. Uh, but that's, that's just the, the way of the game because I really do think that this Padres roster, honestly, and now I think about it, I really am like genuinely interested in a lot of the stuff, a lot of the back end players that the Padres have this year. I really am. Obviously, Xander Bogarts is going to be the thing that gets the fans rising on their feet. Petco Park is going to be outrageous for the home opener, and I can't wait for that. But there are some tertiary pieces that I'm excited about. And in terms of pitching, this is where arguably the more important depth comes from. This is where it gets really important because of the fact that, you know, not too long ago, pre the signing of Michael Waka, the Padres were relying on Nick Martinez and Seth Lugo to at least one of them hit and become, you know, starters in their rotation. I'm not sure who that will be. Nick Martinez is going to be in the the World Baseball Classic, which is interesting. I know he talked about how he's honored to play for USA, um, d- which resulted in a little bit of drama revolving Kevin Acey potentially getting a quote wrong. Doesn't look like he did necessarily. Thinks it might have been a little bit separate. He posted that. So uh, Padres Twitter, as usual, getting on the homie a little bit too much, perhaps. But uh, let's talk about pitchers. My first one is Drew Pomeranz. And I think that this is pretty self-explanatory. Drew Pomeranz, when he was healthy, straight up, was a top 10 reliever in baseball, as far as I'm concerned. There is the potential that if everything goes right, the Padres could have like three top 15 relievers. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Like a hundred, a hundred percent. And Drew Pomeranz is just like one of those guys who, when you watch him pitch, you immediately know what he's going to give you. He's just very, he's just a dynamic kind of pitcher. And in terms of his last 44 and a thirds innings, 1.62 ERA, a 33% strikeout rate, 
and a 181 op opponent batting average against him. The problem is he hasn't pitched in more than 560 damn days. The big thing with Drew Pomeranz is health, and that's it. Straight up the end. But he's a little bit under the radar because of the fact that the Padres have Josh Hader on this team. They have Robert Suarez on this team. And you kind of forget, wow, well, Drew Pomeranz was an elite setup, man, and honestly probably could have been the closer back in 2021 if not for getting hurt. If this guy's healthy, the Padres' bullpen could be one of the best in baseball. I already think it's going to be great. And if the Padres' bullpen reaches its potential, I know that they lost Austin Adams. I know that there are some questions um, surrounding Josh Hader. You know, was that second half? Was that more legit? Like, was it? Is that what we're going to get from him? And or is his best days as a closer behind him? Totally possible. But for Drew Pomeranz, it's all health. So I'm going to be watching this guy very, very closely because if he turns up. And the Padres can go Pomeranz, Suarez, Hader out of the bullpen. It might not even matter whoever the heck the fifth starter is. Because then there's also some other decent guys in there. Nabil Chris Matt's not bad. He really isn't. And then if Seth Lugo or Nick Martinez end up being guys for whatever reason that are in the back of the, the bullpen too, Nick Martinez has been an excellent reliever. Seth Lugo has been an excellent reliever. All of a sudden, things really start coming together. And I think if Drew Pomeranz comes through, that is a big thing for them. Again, those numbers are not, I mean, 2020, he was excellent. Like that was genuinely astounding watching him pitch in 2020. It was, it was phenomenal. And in fact, if not for the fact that they ended up getting Trevor Rosenthal, he probably ends up being um, the closer for that team, that great magical 2020 year. So that's someone to keep an eye on. I know everyone's familiar with him, but because of the kind of domino effect of him being healthy and playing well, that's why you got to keep an eye on Drew Pomeranz. The next one that I want to talk about is a little bit of a quick one. It's me showing off. I want to get some nerd cred real quick. You've probably heard of everyone I've talked about, but I just want to talk about a little bit of an underrated guy to watch when it comes to the farm system, when it comes to the minor leagues only, and it's not necessarily a guy you're probably not going to see him this year, but if some injuries happen, you never know and whatnot. But if you just want to maybe show off to your friends, Angel Felipe, Reliever for the Padres. He's been pitching a little bit in AAA. And I've been notified by him by some other folks. Some other folks said, hey, you looked this up, this guy before. And he's interesting. The guy has looks like he, I mean, he's he's a behemoth. He is the type of guy who, if you play a baseball video game, he is the final boss. That's the type of build this guy has. 6'6", 250 pounds, and he can throw 101 miles per hour. Oh, yeah. And his release is kind of short. It looks like he's cocking back a shotgun. This guy, I don't know if it's, by the way, for the record, I don't know if it's Angel Felipe or Angel Felipe. I wasn't totally sure. It's a little bit hard to get all the, the minor league calls and everything, right? But that's a guy to just keep a little bit of an eye on because there's going to be a lot of guys, don't get me wrong, that we keep an eye on with the Padres system. Probably going to talk about them in a couple of weeks. But Angel Felipe is a type of guy that you need to keep an eye on just because if he starts rising through the rankings and becoming a guy that's a little bit more interesting, you know, I've, I've had Kevin Copps himself on the show before he struggled a little bit last year, but if this guy comes in and delivers on some of those peripherals, I mentioned, it's all about with the farm system this year. It's not necessarily like, Oh, I can't wait to see this guy debut. It's, Oh man, we're recovering that farm. It's healing the regeneration, the Wolverine regeneration that the Padres system has had these past few years after all these trades that AJ Preller has made and the fact that they still keep coming back and somehow managing to have a better farm system, dare I say, than the Oakland A's. Uh, you know what I'm saying? The Oakland A's traded like seven MVP candidates and somehow the Padres still have a shot at having a bar better farm system than, this, than, than, than them this year. I've been talking really fast in this episode today, guys. My apologies. Um, it's really, really exciting. So that's a little bit of an under the radar hipster kind of a needle in the haystack sort of thing or hay in the needle stack for all my SpongeBob um, fans out there. Uh, so, yeah, Angel Felipe, I like the build. I like what he looks like, and he could be a dynamic reliever in the future. And if he turns out really good and has a great season, then that's someone who's going to rise their prospect rankings, hopefully pretty quickly and give the Padres yet another asset to essentially make some moves down the line especially if their starting pitching doesn't turn out great. And that's what I want to conclude today's episode on. It's a starting pitcher. And he is a guy, he is currently my pin tweet on Lockdown Padres. Summoning circle, Adrian Morejon, 
where are you, my guy? He's the last one for me that I want to keep an eye on this year. Look, Adrian Monahon <laughs> has been a guy that I've been looking forward to for a while. He's young and I mean, he's super young. He was actually, when he first kind of came up in 2021, I was like, what the heck? I was watching him in the spring of 20. No, it was actually 2020, I believe. And I was like, he's how old? This guy's 23 years old. He's 23 years old. That's crazy. So he's got still a lot of time. Everyone talks about how young, you know, Ryan Weathers is. And don't get me wrong. That guy might have some potential as well. But for me, Adrian Monahan has at least shown that he has some elite, awesome strikeout stuff. I don't know if he's a starting pitcher. I don't know if he's just a long inning reliever. I don't know if he's a single inning reliever. But because of the talent and because of what he's shown us over, granted, a pretty small sample size, that's what excites me. Look. His fastball is what's the big thing. His fastball has a 90 is in the 96th percentile of spin rate and is in the 92nd percentile for velocity, according to baseball savant. <sighs> mm. Hone, I just don't think that the book is out on him yet. I think that he was coming off Tommy John surgery. It was a low key, really unfortunate blow that the Padres had in 2021. And probably is one of the reasons why they struggle with their pitching depth going on forward. Last year got absolutely torched. He was not very good last year. In fact, he had a 4.24 ERA. He looked weak at points, but the velo and the spin is still there. There's a lot of red on his baseball savant page. If you look in the right places, if you want to look at whiff percentage, it's not that bad. 63%. And he doesn't walk guys. And he can get, make guys kind of chase a decent amount. So the talent is there. There's no doubt about that. And in 2021, you might be saying, oh, well, he had a, I wish that he wasn't only relying on his fastball. Because in 2021, he had a much more varied um, pitch mix. But it's probably closer to what we saw this year, which is mostly fastball. But if he can figure out his changeup, which he's only thrown 4.3% of the time, but generate a 36.4% whiff rate on, if he's able to do that, improve some of his tertiary pitches, he bounces back, you know, it was first year off Tommy John surgery. This could be a sleeper for the Padres, a big time sleeper. And don't get me wrong. I know that there's, this is like the pitching battle for the spring training that everyone's going to be talking about. Is it going to be Ryan Weathers? Is it going to be Jay Groom? Who, not going to lie, personally, I'm rooting for Jay Groom a little bit just because I will be so petty if... Jay Groom, who is the lone player that the Padres got back in the trade of Eric Hosmer. For a reminder, the Padres traded Hosmer, Max Ferguson, second baseman, Corey Rozier, and cash to the Boston Red Sox for Jay Groom. Red Sox, you know, not the best history of decisions these past few years. It would be so legendary and epic if Jay Groom turns out to be good. And th he was just like a, a throw-in piece that the Padres got to get rid of Eric Hosmer who then left the Red Sox afterwards. Right now he's on the Cubs. That would be awesome. It's for that reason, though, that I just think that that's too good to be true, to be perfectly honest with you. So I'm not really expecting it. But um, Ryan Weathers, I think, is a guy that, while he's young and he produced in the first half of 2021, I just think that it was a little bit more fluky and lucky. Hopefully he's... I know there's been some videos going around about a little bit of a change in delivery. But unlike um, Ryan Weathers, the peripherals on... Adrian Monahan, I think, have been a lot better. So if he can improve, if he varies that pitch mix just a little bit more, and if he can stay healthy and just not get hit too much with long ball stuff, don't allow the slugging, my guy. Keep the ball in the park, man. Could he be the fifth starter for the Padres? Or could he just be the second? You know what I mean? Again, if the Padres want to go six, which I don't necessarily think is going to happen, but, hey, maybe, you know, what if Seth Lugo works out for a little bit? Whatever. There are options. And I think Adrian Monahan, man, if he can come through. Granted, the addition of Michael Waka, the late addition of Michael Waka, does ease the kind of need for a guy like Adrian Monahan to break out. I still think the talent's there. I think the talent's there. And I think that this is kind of a make or to break it deal year. Last year of arbitration. I think he's going to be motivated. I think he's going to be pretty steady. And he has been good at times. The key is consistency, varying that pitch mix a little bit, hopefully staying healthy and whatnot, and just kind of going in there and producing. And I think he could be a really good player for the Padres that takes their pitching to the next level and makes us all look back and laugh at the idea that everyone was saying, oh, what are the Padres doing with their rotation? They only have three guys. And we can laugh at all those losers as the Padres hoist. The hoist. Hoist.
that World Series trophy. I'm just saying, guys. So again, just want to run through some of my, some of my under the radar candidates for this 2023 season. Trent Grisham, Luis Campuzano, and Jose Azokar on the offensive side of things. Then Drew Pomeranz, AJ Morajon, and Angel or Angel Felipe on the pitching side of things. Hey, not the. I'm not saying you've never heard of these guys before, but this is what we do. We we give our best estimate. Because I really think that for the most part, all these Padres are kind of known at this point. That's what happens when you spend and trade and wheel and deal the way that the Padres and Peter Seidler and AJ Preller, who I'm still begging to murder me. I'm still begging, you know, re- replace my head like the like Indiana Jones does with the golden statue in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Just leave it there. Have me get crushed by the boulder. That'd be great. We'll see, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see. A lot of exciting players, though, this season. I'm not making up my enthusiasm. I'm very excited for some of these kind of under-the-radar guys for 2023. But with that all being said, that about does it, ladies and gentlemen, for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter, at Javapeno, or at LO underscore Padres. And also, look forward to tomorrow's episode. Going to be talking with my guy, Ben Kaspik, been a while of Lockdown Giants to talk about the very different off seasons that the Giants and the Padres had uh, very different, but you might be surprised by some of my takes on the Giants. Actually, uh, don't totally sleep. This division's going to be stacked, man. Forget the Rockies. They're whatever. This division's going to be good this year. The Padres are awesome, but they, there aren't no slouches in the NOS. Dimebacks and San Francisco Giants are coming. So we're going to be talking about that. And then to be quite honest with you, don't know fully what we're going to be doing for Thursday and Friday, but it's going to be very delicious and yummy and fantastic. So look forward to that. And of course, as always, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My Friday faithful homies, take care.